Well, get these microphones under control. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and it's uh, always a pleasure to be back in, in Brisbane. I, for those who don't know, I actually went to school here, Ascot Primary School, and uh, I've got a bit of technology here, uh, and so I always like coming back here to, to Brisbane. So, um, AI ethics, and I'm going to speak about uh, innovation as well. But I should just uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we're uh, meeting today, the Turrbal people and the Jagara people. And we should remember that, you know, the indigenous people have lived on these lands for now up to, we think, 25,000 years of uninterrupted habitation. And I think it's very important that we recognise that as we meet today. So I'd like to pay my respect to elders past and present. Thanks, Kyle, for your wonderful introduction, and Graham as well. And Graham, uh, firstly to you, to Microsoft, it's great to see the leadership that uh, in this area of AI and that partnership for AI is really important. And I've been uh, I've worked with Microsoft many years, and it's great to see the way that they're staring into many of the social issues that because their platform is so pervasive, and it's uh, I think really great they're doing. And to Carl and Cedar, I mean this is uh, great that you uh, having this sort of uh, dialogue because this is a complex area we're talking about, and. I don't think there's any simple answer. I wish there was. Um, but we're starting to get into an area that is, um, you know, even if we, uh, who have an ethical base and a values base, that we might be able to find a way to navigate the way through this, the world's not all like that, unfortunately. And so we've got to also guard against, you know, aspects that are maybe not uh, have the greater good in mind. So great to have Cedar doing that. Now, I've been up here th uh, today because, you know, I, as you s Graham said, I'm chairman of CSRO and I, so I went out to uh, our site here and it's great to have some of the CSRO team here, but this is the Pullenvale site and I just saw four of the teams there and, cause, uh, and they knew I was being about AI, but it wasn't sort of set up. But I, I went and saw we've got the new robotics centre. What's robotics all about? You know, Lots of AI, lots of algorithms sort of sitting behind it. So that's a, a great facility out there that they've got that just set up. I saw, you know, the Zebedee, the 3D uh, imaging capable we use down in mines. And this is incredible because mines are trying to, you know, map the area. But you're trying to find out who's down there, what's going on. Again, you know, algorithms that are doing that. You know, we're doing the work there on hydrogen, the new work on hydrogen, which we think is very exciting, um, and we think it could be a really a great source of energy going forward. Uh, again, a lot of the uh, intelligence sitting behind that, as you try to scale that to commercialise it, is a lot of uh, modelling work. So no matter where you look, you know, this uh, uh, AI sort of uh, appears. Now, I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, Graham, very kind of you, but I want to say I am not an ethicist. Uh, I am not... Uh, an AI programmer. Uh, I am not a qualified scientist. I did an arts degree in anthropology and English, and what's more, it was medieval English of all things. Um, but I do deal with a lot of scientific ethical issues. I mean, it's sitting on the board of CSRO. Uh, we have to look at a lot of the science we do and look at the bigger implications around what could this mean? I mean, as you will all be aware, you know, genetic engineering is a lot in our, in our products and we have to look at the long-term impacts of that. Even our mining uh, in terms of or hydrology, water management, these have long-term ethical issues. And I have to say, and that CSRO, because I didn't know this before I, I joined CSRO, has an incredible ethical framework that they work with that everything, everything that's published, every project we get involved in has to go through the ethical committee. And I'll come back to this because this is really important. If you grab AI at the end, when you look at the implication, you've lost it. It's actually at the production end. When the code's written, how do you put in place you know, controls or values that are going to control what is actually produced? So we're no different to uh, many other people. Don't know who's written the, uh, read The Economist uh, this week, but uh, I just picked it up this morning. 
And the uh, previous uh, founder of Deep Mind is quoted, who's uh, Mustafa Suleiman. And it's a very good little article. It's not a big article, it's quite short. But this is what he said around AI. And this is the guy, remember Deep Mind? This is what Google bought in 2014. He said, AI offers a unique opportunity for social progress, but it will only do good if it is held to the highest ethical standards. That's from the guy that was pushing the edge. So I think that's really a salient lesson for us. Anyone that's in this room, I'm sorry, every one of us in the room, we're going to be impacted by this technology in some way. So we've got to think through it. But I just want to be clear, I am not the expert, but I do care about it passionately. Okay, so just a few little bit, uh, so what I'll go through, I'll just make a few comments to start with, then I'll, I will look at a few more areas where I see, um, you know, AI appearing, and then I will try to come back to some of the concerns and some of the frameworks. I'm not going to lay out an ethical framework. I'll, I'll explain that why, because I think even, you know, listening to Graham talking about Microsoft, I, I think there's a lot of work going on in that area. We do need it, but I'm not going to lay it out. Uh, I'll talk about a few principles on it. Okay, so firstly, AI itself. I, I do think you've got to be really clear when you're talking about AI. It, it is a very simple term that covers a lot of areas. You see, AI really goes from... You know, the simplest end, which is in computing terms, I mean, when I did my program in Assembler, I would write algorithms around calculating foreign transactions. That was an algorithm. Nobody checked it. I could have been adding, you know, a couple of decimal points and pulling off. But that's, that's a little bit of intelligence. And so, and then that grew. And so algorithms have been around for a long time. When you use your... Um, you know, conference phone in all those uh, wonderful Telstra calls you do, um, it's got algorithms there sort of trying to optimise the voice quality all the time. This is nothing new. It's been around for years. Then you sort of go from algorithm upon algorithm and then you start to get into machine learning where a machine self-learning and self sort of monitoring itself, that's a whole other area. And then you go to the end of the spectrum when you start getting AI into robots or things. And even I remember that experience of when I got uh, my Alexa or my Google Home or using Cortana. There's something different when you start interacting with a thing, isn't it? I mean, has anyone had this experience? Even Siri, you know. I mean, not that it's, it's interesting being the human reaction to Siri. Not that that's pure AI, but there's a certain sense of analytics going on behind it. But when you get to the absolute end is when you start talking around, you know, robots that maybe have a sense of consciousness or will they ever, exp you know, have emotion or self-awareness, you're in a whole other world, okay? So, there, so we've got to be clear about where in the spectrum we're talking about. There's another definition which is called sort of narrow and then general and then defence. So defence gets put in a different category because you get into all these ethical issues around, you know, um, non-human combatants, you know, and uh, what does that mean? By the way, I do understand that the Australian Army has said very clearly that there will be no warfare, you know, when there's a human life involved without a human involved. So they've made a decision in terms of how they use technology. That's a really big decision. And so keeping the human element in this decision-making we'll come back to later on. So be clear about when people talk to you about AI has changed the world, you've got to be really clear about what you're talking about. Now, remember, we, a lot of people think, remember all the Department of Human Services, they ran those bots around, you know, who wasn't paying their, you know, um, get, getting their... In fact, it wasn't who, who was receiving a benefit who shouldn't have been, and that was a, a bot. They called it a bot that went through the database, and there was great consternation. This was artificial intelligence. It was a simple bot looking at 10 different factors and then splitting out a report. The question was, where was the human judgment in that? But so you've got to be careful. So I just want... I'm mainly going to talk today around narrow AI, which is more around the algorithm side, because if I go off into, you know, humanoids and things like that, by the way, I think personally, I think it's a a long way away if it'll ever arrive. I'm not convinced that you can ever teach a robot to have an emotional feeling. Uh, now, 
People will argue with me. I'm sure maybe you can get it to a certain level, but I'm not convinced that you have that. You know when that feeling of fear, when your gut wrenches? I'm not sure, okay, how would you ever, you know, program a, you know, a robot to feel that? Anyway, you can argue with me, but that's a good one. You know, okay. So, um, and then as Graham said, the, the other critical thing about this is that the effectiveness of, of algorithms or uh, any form of AI is dependent upon the uh, actual amount of data and the quality of the data. And I don't know about uh, your world, but the quality of the data that I often come across is um, not perfect. Um, anyone who's run a big organisation would understand that. So, and then there's obviously uh, all those things around cloud computing. So, but let's just sort of be clear about what we're talking about. What we're trying to get to is when, you know, AI is used that sort of has a sort of a questionable output. Um, and in a report that was done recently, you know, we, we've had in Australia here, we've had data sets loaded up into, you know, gov.au that came from the health data record and pharmaceutical and it was actually identifiable. Remember that issue? I think it was back a couple of years ago. So actually data, data integrity and privacy actually feeds directly into AI. Or well, there was that example in Houston where um, the education department was running an AI program against the effectiveness of teaching, you know, and using a whole lot of algorithms, and a couple of people got fired. But nobody quite understood what the algorithms were, and so there wasn't judgment applied. Or um, there's a, a program that is, or an AI tool used in the US, uh, around uh, the propensity for um, uh, offenders to re-offend. And uh, that's an interesting case in itself that would give a judge sort of some insight about the probability of re-offending. And, of course, it was seen to be very biased. Uh, somehow, you know, African-Americans somehow had this greater... Uh, inclination to reoffend, and it was wasn't based on fact. So you see, this is turning up in many, many places already, and uh, and it's really, you know, it, I think incumbent upon all of us to uh, to to think about it. I was reading, um, I can't remember where it was. This particular article, it, you know, you've all heard the automated vehicles about, you know, self-driving cars, and then the ethical questions. So th this little bit, I actually it may have been in this report. I can't remember. But, you know, you buy your new autonomous vehicle and it asks you a question. It says, you know, um, how do you want me to judge your moral code? High, medium or low? <laughs> uh, give me a break. I'm not quite sure where that one goes. Or it says, now, in a, in a situation of harm, would you like me to prioritise the occupants of the car or would you like me to you know, prioritise the pedestrians? You know, well... Give me a break. You know, I, I don't know. Um, well, I do know, actually. Um, I know what I do. Um, and, you know, of course, the other one is, you know, if I've got this, you know, the, what was, it, was it the trolley question? I think it was called the trolley question. Yeah, you know, yeah, which way do I go? You know, the pram, the young person or not. But, uh, you know, this is, this, these are real things, you know. So things are being coded in that world. Now, um, I do want to just mention that... Um, so there's a lot of thinking going on in this area, and, and so as, as Cida and Lynn, uh, we talk, talked about, it, this whole area around policy development is really important. I don't know if you've seen, but you know, there's been a lot of development right across the world already. Um, so even you know, France, I think, put something out at the end of last year. The EU has already put out a lot of uh, uh, good documentation. Uh, India put out something in June 2017 around AI and ethics. Uh, Germany was 17. China did something in April 2018. And Canada did it in 2017. So there's a lot of very good, rich literature out there around trying to look at these ethical frameworks. Now, the question is, um, you know, how, what can we learn? What, what can we take as sort of best practice from this? So I just want to touch on a, a few general comments. Um, look, my, my view is that AI actually does present enormous opportunity. I mean, social, um, environmental, uh, and economic. But I'm not convinced that the distribution of the value is going to be equitable, and that concerns me. I'm not saying it 
will or it won't, but I think that any times we have disparate knowledge or asymmetry of knowledge, you get inequity in systems, and we need to be really careful of that. Um, I do also think that it's very important that we use the ethical standards that we expect of each other, enshrined in the United Nations, in our constitution, into this world of AI. I'm not convinced that we need to go and build something different. We're human beings, for goodness sake, and we should... This digital world is subject to the same way that I behave on the table at lunch as in this digital world, and I have always argued against a different set of standards on the internet or in technology. Uh, I just don't think it's real. And uh, the, the, you know, the things that have happened this week in Christchurch, as shocking as that is, you know, I think prove absolutely that point. So we're talking about very real things. That's a little bit of an extension, but is there. Um, I do think there's a very strong sense of fairness that we need to make sure pervades. I think Graham mentioned that in his uh, comments as well, and gone with transparency. The thing that where I get most worried about is when I don't understand something. Um, Catherine and I'll have a conversation in a moment, and Catherine and I are just talking. Um, the, the issue about, you know, when, when I test an idea, or I mean, even as a, a manager or a leader, you're always uh, cross collab, you know, sort of triangulating data and facts for consistency, aren't you? I mean, that's just what the nature of, I think, the human person, human being is about. And, you know, so you do get a lot of conversations around human intervention in AI things, and I do think that's really important. I talked around the army example. But this is really important. So we need to have balancing points. It's no different to order and controls. It's like three levels of defence. You know, you need values, you need controls, and you need some governing process. So we're going to have to think through that one, And because I, I don't know the complete answer of this one because of the issue around when this stuff is written or, or created. Uh, and I do think we've uh, got to keep protecting people's right to define their own privacy. You see, I'm of the school that privacy to me, my sense of privacy is completely different to what everyone in this room will be. And, but the one thing I do know in our society is we should choose it ourselves. And I think that has been a really important principle of which we're starting to see to play out in social networking. So the sense of privacy in this AI world, because you are starting to deal with a lot of, you know, potentially a lot of personalised data, and we've seen that uh, in the Facebook situation. Uh, and I do think the other thing we've got to realise that in our, this wonderful world of technology, um, Australia can take a position, but uh, it doesn't really matter if China goes somewhere else and US goes somewhere else and Europe goes somewhere else. So we're going to need real international collaboration. So look, there are just some of the sort of general comments. I mean, look, I, I could talk for a long time about, you know, how we within CSRO are using machine learning uh, and uh, different algorithms. I mean, it is so much a part of what we do. In fact, we've got a project on at the moment looking at where publicly funded science and research will be in the next 10 to 20 years. And we're trying to look at what impact that will have on every division within CSIRO because it'll be changed. The role of scientists will be different. You know, we'll be able to automate things in the lab, we'll be able to do analytics differently, we'll be able to collect data in different ways. So I think that the impact of, uh, of this technology is far-reaching and you've got to spend time thinking about what it'll mean and then overlay that ethical you know, framework on top of that. Uh, and you know, as well, we're looking at you know, just how we can use it um, in terms of our future science platforms as well. So let me just go through you know, some of the concerns and then I'll wrap and we'll be up here in five minutes. OK, Catherine. So, so when you start looking at you know, the concerns, firstly... There's this sense of frameworks, lots of frameworks out there. I think we've got to be really careful not to just adopt 
the first one that comes along. We've got to think about what's right for us, but in an international context. I've talked around this dynamic assessment, i.e. it's too late when you've got abuse of, you know, of individuals. You've got to get the sense right back early. And then you get to this question of authorship. Authorship. Code is written by people, uh, not by, well, they write code and it may start generating its own code. That's it. So there is a little bit of a you know, complexity there. But it still starts with people. So the authorship is really important. Anonymity is what is not right. And I think that's a very big uh, point because we've got to be able to at least understand the origins of this. Uh, I've talked around e in education engagement. I am concerned that there is not a good understanding of it. In fact, if anything, there's fearfulness, there's concern, though, you know, as we were just talking, I think people are willing to consider it if it's of advent advantage to them personally. But as soon as it's not adv advantageous to them, you watch, there'll be a reaction. It's no different to the social media platforms. When they're working for you, you love them. But when they turn on you, you know, woe is us and blacklist them. Um, and so I think there is a, a question around citizen employment uh, and engagement and that we need to make sure that they are empowered to make the right decisions and that requires education. I think we've got to be really careful that AI, by definition, dealing with data, you know, may not have empathy. In fact, I don't know how to code empathy. Um, and empathy is a fundamental human trait that we really need. There are many areas where you don't need empathy, let me assure you, but there's many areas where you do, and so we need to uh, be very careful. And then I've, I've heard um, it said in some of these frameworks, well, we've, you know, we've got to look at the wider benefit, the wider benefit. But, you know, I, whenever people say benefit to me, yeah, I always worry a bit. Are you talking about social benefit, economic benefit, environmental benefit? So you've got to be really careful we don't get caught in nice words. We've got to really unpick this. Uh, and yes, you know, at times you need to look to the greater whole, uh, and even though it may be a minor, uh, you know, infliction on a few, but we need to be very careful. So look, there are a few of the things, and look, Catherine and I can work through that. But I do think, I think Graham touched on, you know, some of the framework. Um, and I think that, you know, there's lots of good work out there today, which I don't want to talk about. But we do need to keep uh, really focused on this area. It's a very important thing for our society. Um, there isn't immediate answers. We've got to start to work through those ourselves. You need to work through it yourselves. But we shouldn't let it stop innovation. We should not let it stop innovation. We must keep pushing the boundaries, but in an ethical way. So let me finish on um, uh, Mustafa again, because he finished his article. He said, uh, AI is the greatest opportunity we have had for generations to advance the causes of social justice, equality, and the reduction of human suffering. So there you go. So there's a little bit of both sides there. So, Catherine, um, we will go to Q&A. Uh, so, so, thanks very much.